Political Science Society of Montana State University, and welcome to our um, election night watch party. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. Hope you all are having a nice night. Um, first, we're going to start off with. Um, I need the agenda. Oh, co host introduction. Is that me? <laughs> we're going to start off with. Um, an introduction from Montana State University President Lucas. Um, go ahead and take the wheel. Yeah, my name is Lucas Olkers. I'm currently an associate student with MSU President. We have some senators in here, three senators. This is a large proportion of our body. Um, Stratton wanted me to talk about why voting is important. But this group already knows that, so so I'm gonna open it up to whatever you guys want to talk about. If you wanna um, talk about, I'm kind of an expert on campus politics. Um, if you wanna know what's going on on the campus, what ASMSU's up to, um, I'll I'll do whatever you guys want. I'll field all your questions, or if you wanna get into the um, the races that went tonight, we can start getting into that. But um, does anyone have any comments? I have a question for yeah, you. Yeah, what do you got? Strand? So you can grill me. What is the <laughs> what is the relationship between like our student government politics and our local politics, and how do they work together to create policy for students? Ah, that's a good question. Um, generally, student government tries to be non-affiliated with anyone, right? To, to begin with, we're we're nonpartisan. Um, I I'd, I'd like to talk about the legislature a little bit as we get into this as well. Um, because, I mean, we employ a, a lobbyist, a student lobbyist that goes up to Helena, um, lives in Helena, University of Missoula um, over there. They have a student lobbyist, and then all the student governments together have our own lobbyist. So there's three student lobbyists that are up lobbying, which would be, the reason for that is because we're reactive to everything. ASMSU is not a political organization innately, but yet we're still involved in politics. So we're reactive. A bill gets brought up in the legislature. We have to say, is it good for the students or bad for the students? Um, I think that's an important thing to do. Um, that's not saying that we're the ones writing the bills or um, doing anything like that yet. Um, that we still need to be involved in the process because we want to ensure that students' voices are being heard when decisions are being made. Um, that's, that's the main purpose of us um, employing those lobbyists. And that's also something it, I wanted to talk to you guys tonight. One, we have that lobbyist. We don't have it filled right now. We have one applicant, but if you know anyone who would like to live in Helena this next semester, you get paid, you get housing, um, you get food stipends. It's kind of a cool gig. Um, they can be a current student at MSU, um, and they take online classes up there, or they could have graduated within the last year. So they could be um, graduating at fall um, this semester, and then they need a job. For three months after they graduate, um, the lobbyist is a good um, kind of placeholder, footholder to get into um, the political science areas. The other thing is that when we go up to the legislature, we'll need people. Um, we have one day, it's called the Rotunda Day, that all the student governments go to um, Helena and we, we lobby, talk to all the legislatures, and um, so that'll be coming up. You'll hear a date on that. Hopefully you can join us. Um, and there's people that are going up weekly to Helena. So if you want to hop on a um, hop on a van to go up there, like we'll we'll find you a room. We'll find you a way to get up there. Um, I'm sure that you'll get some food paid for too, and um, a good time. Getting back to your point, Strand. What do we? So local politics is a little bit something different. Um, the university has taken a strong stance that we're not the sole person to fix, like say the housing issue in, in, in Bozeman. Look at the housing issue. Um, the university ourselves has built two new residence halls in the last five years. Um, so we've addressed as we've grown by about 20% in the last 10 years, we have increased our housing capacity by the same margin, um, but the town of Bozeman has not. And so it's a town of Bozeman issue is a lot of this. Um, yet still, student government, we're trying to get a better working relationship, I'd say, with uh, local governments. There's a few groups that are 
um, working with uh, district legislatures um, about anti-hazing legislation. Um, we have a senator that's um, looking at trying to get lights on um, Greek Way, the fraternity and sorority life houses. Um, we work very closely, I'd say, with the police department, the Bozeman Police Department, since we have our own police department. Student government is always kind of in that little triangle um, with those three, especially when and any anything that happens, whether it's criminal or civil, um, domestic stuff, um, that all, that also gets involved. What else you guys got? What gossip you want to hear? What gossip? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, we all know, like you said, we all know why the voting is important. Um, what would you say to somebody who, you know, just turned 18 and maybe doesn't really know much about politics or voting? Like, what would you tell them? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Number one, I think we all know, we all know this. It's important to get involved um, in the things that you do. So that's, that's going to why am I, why did I run to be um, student body president? I ran because it's important to be I guess I ran because people told me to run, right? I, I don't, I'm not going to be the person who, who should want to be the president. You, I don't think that anyone should ever want that. Um, you get lifted up by the people around you, you get identified by your friends and your peers and you say, that person should run. You say, okay, we got your support now, now we'll run. Um, and the reason for that is, is at any level, it's important to get involved. Uh, my dad was mayor of our town for 30 years, a town of about 700 people. And it's, that's an important thing. Um, it's not. It's not like that. That's a huge thing. You have like seven hundred people. You're like, I'm the mayor. It's like, I mean, that's that's now he's a county commissioner. Um, but it's to be involved in any level is important uh, because that's about caring about the people around you. So I'd say one, get involved in your own local politics, and then two, the other thing is you're gonna get out in the world, and however, who pays your taxes, all the laws that are made, all your votes matter, and all that, right? Who you pick, and it's. No matter if you say that whoever is elected as politician is going to affect your daily life, um, so you, but you should be involved in that. Thank you. Any other Mesa, what do you got? <laughs> I think um, I'd be interested to hear kind of what you think about um, kind of the impacts that state politics, more than local politics, have had on campus life. Yeah, so right now you're basically you're an in-state student. About 41% of your tuition is subsidized by the state legislature. Um, that number from about 30 years ago has decreased um, by like 15%. So it used to be over half of your tuition was subsidized by the state legislature. Now it's less than that. There's a lot of different maybe reasons. There's we have had an increase in out-of-state tuition um, that we haven't been inspected as much about that, right? So if a student comes and they pay out-of-state tuition, they don't get any state subsidies. They have, they're paying way more than the in-state um, person is. So they are helping also feed into they are help paying in-state students as well. So that's kind of been the model that MSU's taken the approach of letting in a bunch of out-of-state students because then they're also subsidizing those in-state students. It's for the land grant university. That, that's what we do. We educate the, the students of Montana. About over 40% of the students that are from Montana that are in college come to MSU. Um, in talking about the whole MUS system, we educate 40% of the Montana students that are in the, the entire MUS system. Um, so we're large educators of, of, the, of the Montana kids, and the state legislature heavily um, subsidizes your tuition. Yeah, Graham? Yeah, I mean, is that what you need for me? I don't know what you is. want. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we want. <laughs> I actually have a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, so if, well, I was going to phrase it correctly. It's like, 40% is subsidized. So yeah. really any decision that the state legislation makes directly impacts the students, correct? Yeah, with a budget, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So do you have any, uh, can you provide any foresight into what you think may or may not happen this next legislative session? We've had, over the last, in 2018, there's been a 12% increase in state proportions 
um, in the funds. It used to be about 7,000 in 2018, and now we're at about 10,500 per, um, it, it's called FTE. And that's, that means that it's like, it's based on 15 credits a semester. So if you're taking 15 credits, you're considered a one FTE. If you're taking less than that, you're like a 0.95 or whatever it is um, proportion. So per FTE, there's about $10,500 of state funds that, that gets put in per um, in-state student. And there's been an increase over the last since 2018. And I would say I personally know some of the people who are making some of those budgets and we are, yeah, it, uh, that, that trend will continue to rise. Um, I, the funding for the universities, we're, we're, we're doing fine, um, but yet Montana still, we're like, we're really low in the states, in the national averages for like state per per proportions per um, capita per in-state student. We're just always under, there's no metric in funding that we're above the the 50% median um, for, for state funding. So we're definitely always low. We're, we've always been low, but we're we're moving up, I'd say. Cool. Um, any other questions for President Elkers? Anything else? Cool. All right. Hello. Well, moving on. Yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. So yeah. What's next? <laughs> We are going to talk about the importance of the congressional race. Yeah. We don't have that part, right? Um, then we do later. Okay. So. Yeah. yeah. So this is the first time since 1990 that Montana has had two districts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you to all the people moving here. Um, exciting. Yeah, I got homework to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Yeah. It was fun. Thank you guys for growing this. Hopefully you guys can get more people to come too. Yeah, do we have any viewers yet? Yeah. Uh, no. Oh, no. Oh, zero viewers and zero likes. You can go back and watch yourself. That's yeah, so it, like even though it's live, like yeah. whenever someone logs in, they can start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, they can catch up. It posts as like a YouTube video yeah. after the live's over. Okay. Yeah. Are you getting funding for your club for those snacks? Yeah, we're getting reimbursed. So the, the, the department's so, going to reimburse. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, it's also the mass funding, too. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're going to work apply, on that in the spring. So we, yeah. are, we're, we just we're started our club. So. Yeah. 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 We'll rather restart it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, good luck, guys. Yeah. Yeah. See you later. Have a good one. So, yeah. Very <clears throat> mm -hmm. so. so This is the first time since 1990 that we have had two districts. And much like... Um, Back in the days, it split pretty east and west. Um, it's very similar to the previous split. Um, and yeah, on the western side of the state, you have Monica Trinnell running as a Democrat, um, Ryan Zinke as a Republican, and John Lamb as a Libertarian candidate. On the eastern side of the state, you've got Matt Rosendale as a Republican. Um, Penny Ronning as a Democrat, and um, Gary Buchanan, sorry, I forgot his first name for a minute, um, as an independent, and there is a little toss-up in there. We've got a libertarian Sam Rankin um, running in that eastern half as, as well. Um, even though it's not as much of a contested race as the um, western half, it's still a pretty heavy race. Um, but people are more concerned about what's going to happen in the western half because that technically is a new district. Matt Rosendale was the incumbent. Um, and right now, Monica Trinnell and uh, Ryan Zinke are neck and neck in the polls. So it'll be an interesting shakeout to see how this happens. Yeah, I think we actually have some polling data. Yes, yeah, so let's check the polling data. So... Yeah, we're sitting right about, yeah, 34% for Zinke, 32% for Trinnell right now. And the most updated one from October 14, so almost a month ago. But that is the most updated polling that they have on that race. Um, I also heard from some professors it was right around 42 to 42. Yeah. And in, in so very, very close. Um, and it's likely we won't know a winner tonight of the race. Yeah. In case there's recounts and all sorts of stuff. So and you can almost bet that there's gonna be a recount. So yeah. But yeah. Um and 
it'll be interesting, like I said, to see how that shake, shakes out. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of a little worried about absentee voters right now because um, the postal system has not been that great. Sure, yeah, yeah, I know. Um... The nice thing with that too is like a lot of us who are live in town can just go drop off their ballot at yeah. the courthouse. So that was pretty nice. Um, that's like, you know, just, it's, it's good. Um, yeah. I had to, cause I got married and so I changed my name and then I had, I found out I was moving right after I changed my ballot. So then I had to update my ballot twice and it got flagged. <laughs> so I had to go down and talk to them. And there were so many people that came in that had no idea how to get a replacement ballot. We are very lagging in voter education as far as like those kind of things go. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Um, the nice thing is when I went into the courthouse, they like their elections office was not overwhelmed yesterday. So that was mm -hmm. nice. Um, they had a pretty good system and it was in and out. Uh, I have no clue how it looked over there today. But, yeah. 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 I think it'd be interesting to see whether or not the weather impacted yeah. how they regularly yeah. run. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking about that too, like people who just don't want to vote now because they don't want to drive yeah. to a voting station, especially in rural Montana, that yeah. could be yeah. a really big problem. Or even just in Bozeman with all the, you know, out-of-state drivers. <laughs> yeah, so yeah that's true. Yeah. So, yeah, that'll be interesting to see. Your agenda fell asleep. Can you unlock it, please? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to steal it back anyway. We're talking about the Western days, so yeah. it's not. Yeah, um, see, you need that. Yeah, I have my notes on here. Well, also, there's a note about the importance of making sure to, to stop in before the polls close yeah. this yes. evening. Wow, we still have time on the clock yeah. until that happens. Yes, definitely. We need to do that. We until need to get, 8 p.m. People need to get out and so. vote. Yes. This is, people think that it's not that important of an election, but this is a landmark election for Montana. It is. It's the first time in, uh, 30 years, 30, 30 32 years, years yeah. So no, that's, that's, that's hard. It's a lot. <laughs> I didn't say it was Str a long Strength time. saying 32 years is an extremely long I didn't say that. Dude, I turned 31 in two weeks. <laughs> that's crazy. So we haven't had two house districts as long no, as No, it before. is wild. It's yeah, wild. it's wild. So. I just have to get, I had to give you. Yeah. Um, cool. I think we could probably like get into our candidates a little bit in that yep. Western district since it's tied race, talk about um, what they're about and maybe what some like representational styles are going to be if they're elected to office. Um, and yeah, why do you want to start with Monica Trinnell? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, she um, grew up in the Billings area, um, graduated from Gonzaga and went to work as an uh, attorney, really centered her work around energy rights in Montana, um, and really has framed her campaign as working for the average Montana citizen. Um, <clears throat> one of her big um, hallmark achievements, um, according to her campaign, is fighting Northwestern energy um, to lower um, energy rates. Um, as far as general issues go, she aligns herself pretty heavily with the National Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, not to the extent that a progressive might, but she is a solid uh, moderate um, Democrat. Um, she's in favor of what she calls common sense gun control. So favoring the Second Amendment, um, which she calls as a way of life in Montana, but also favoring universal background checks. Um, she's in favor of supporting uh, abortion access um, across the United States. Um, as far as that, she she really is, not to downplay her, but a, a, almost a run-of-the-mill Democrat. Yeah, and a former Republican, too, which yeah. is an interesting yeah. piece into that. So, yeah. yeah, she did previously run for, I think it was... Um, wasn't it county attorney or not? It not was a commission. Attorney. Yeah, it was um, county service. commission. Right? The county commission? I, was county, service. I think county commission in 2020. Yeah, yeah. and that yeah. one was as a Republican. Yeah. Interesting. You know, I personally, and I don't know if this is what she did, but I think from a strategy point of view, it's probably pretty um, smart of her to run as a Democrat because if she were to run as a Republican, 
I don't think she would have beat Zinke in no. the primaries. I don't yeah. think anybody would have. Well, I mean, it was a close race in the primaries. Um, Dr. Al only lost by I think 3,000 votes in the primary in the Western District. So it was extremely close. They had to do a recount. Oh, yeah, um, that's true. So I, I don't know, but they, I mean, even like a third person in that primary, that might have been hectic. Yeah. Um, so, and she won her primary pretty easily yeah. over mm -hmm. Cora Newman. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, she did. But I know if I were running, that's what I would do. I would run as a Democrat in the Western District because you're more likely, I feel like in the Western District, it'd be lean more towards the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm a little surprised that Sinki's polling so well. But, sure. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I'm not surprised that she um, previously held Republican beliefs because of where she's from originally. I mean, and, and that's that on that point that you made. The Eastern District is is going to be like well, pretty overwhelmingly Republican or leaning in conservative, and she <clears throat> of the two districts has a much better chance of winning yeah. as a Democrat or with more progressive ideology. Um, in that sense, in the Western District of the East. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one thing she does have to be careful about is, though, is moderating that progressive language. Because yeah. Western District is obviously leaning more towards Democrats. Mm -hmm. We have the state's largest urban centers. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of rural communities, and a lot of those urban centers have a yeah. large population of older voters. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. She strikes me as being more of a moderate Democrat, not a progressive Democrat. More like, um, I, I said this a while back, uh, I feel like... The Democrats that I'm seeing lately that are very moderate are what old school Republicans would have been mm -hmm. like, you know, 20, 30, mm -hmm. 40 years ago. Yeah. And I think yeah. part of it just comes from that when you are running as a Democrat in Montana, you have to be more moderate in ideology. Also, you have to moderate your language. Um, just knowing the nature of most rural voters, it, it, it yeah. would be extremely, extremely hard if you're going to be as progressive as representatives in, in other states. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I think another part of that too, she aligns pretty well with former governor Steve Bullock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. might be, you know, relate to a lot of voters in the Western District. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. definitely. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I get, you know, next we can go into Ryan Zinke a little bit, the Republican nominee for this congressional district. Um, I did some stuff on him. Um, so former Navy SEAL for over 20 years. Um, he's the first Navy SEAL that was elected to the House of Representatives. In uh, 2015, he served in the state house before that from 2009 to 2013. Um, and they served in the U.S. House until 2017 before he became Secretary of the Interior under the Trump administration. Um, he stepped down in 2019 following some ethics allegations, and then he was um, charged from some ethics committees for those allegations later. Um, and while he was in office, he served on mainly the Armed Services Committee and the Natural Resource Committee in the House, um, specifically the subcommittees on like sea power and projection forces, um, emerging threats and capabilities. And then over in the Resource Committee, he was on the subcommittees Energy and Mineral Resource and the Federal Lands Subcommittee. So he has a lot of um, legislation experience in subcommittee work, especially um, federal lands, which affect Montana pretty highly. And so it's an interesting interesting deal. Um, he also, uh, one other thing to note, he uh, removed himself from the Republican National Convention in 2016 because the Republicans were advocating to return federal lands to the states and he didn't agree with that. He agreed more with like reforming the bureaucracy that does run those federal lands to work more cooperatively with the states and so he actually removed himself from the convention because of that. So Has he changed that position? Um, that or no? I think he's still on that position, um, mainly because of his work as Secretary of the Interior. Um, and he like was using power as Secretary of the Interior to promote coal and mining usage from federal lands. And I think that's um, a big reason also why he believes in federal lands over the states having them. So, yeah. It'll be very interesting to see where those two candidates kind of match up or diverge on energy policy, because it sounds like both of them have a mm -hmm pretty intense focus on that, um, which makes sense for a state like Montana, but um, be interesting to see kind of where those policies and where those are. Yeah. yeah, speaking along those lines, I think it's interesting to note, Zinke was formerly a supporter of climate change activism and climate change policy when he was in the state house. Um, he wrote multiple pieces of legislation to the Obama administration advocating for those things. But um, 
I think since he entered the U.S. House and has been Secretary of the Interior, that's kind of changed in his um, his public statements on that on climate change specifically have changed, and it's a little more along the lines of the um, contemporary Republican Party, where it's more of a hoax than an actual um, line of which we need to be following as a society. So I think that's interesting to note as well going into this race. I think that's a big difference that might be an election difference between Trinnell and him yeah. is climate change activism. So, yeah. It's really interesting to me that as a Republican, he, the federal lands issue, like instead of the state control over that, because most Republicans are very like state centric, yeah, mm -hmm. small federal government. So that's, that's kind of like surprising. Yeah. I, I didn't know that about him. And part of that might be teaming with the administration to promote um, domestic economic policy and export. Mm -hmm. So that might be a part of it and be yeah. more self-sufficient. And so. he did have an endorsement, didn't he? I believe so when he um, was running for re-election because um, he won re-election and then was promoted into the cabinet. Yeah. So in 2016. So I think he was Trump endorsed in his 2016 campaign. But I, don't I thought he was Trump endorsed in this one too. I don't know for sure. I don't remember. I don't know if he's endorsed, but I, I remember he aligned himself pretty heavily. He does. Yeah, he's, he, very he he's very much with the party. He's very much with the contemporary Republican party. Um, or even like the, the Trump side, especially the Republican Party, um, in other issues outside of his work with the Armed Forces Committee and such. Um, very much uh, like a pro-modern Second Amendment person that doesn't believe in background checks and such. Um, and I think we could expect that from him in Congress as well to vote against that type of legislation if it were to come up. So, yeah. I think, I think Trump did endorse him in this one. I'm looking it up right now. I'll let you know. A okay. question I want to ask real quick, and I don't know if you know that yeah. this is okay, but I was looking at fundraising debt, and I know Zinke has uh, Trinell beat by at least a couple million. Oh, really? Um, I did not know. But I know over the past like several months, ev almost every commercial political advertisement I've seen has been for Monica Trinell. I haven't seen any Zinke until the past two weeks. Interesting. Are you talking about, sorry, I missed that last on like advertisement for it or? Yeah. So, so I was he, just thinking about that Monica Chanel ads that are like yeah. everywhere. I wonder, every I wonder if that commercial. is targeted to Bozeman because it is a fairly yes. novelist, a mm -hmm. little bit bluer area. Mm -hmm. For history. sure. Um, so mm -hmm. I wonder if that's, you know, really targeted and think he might have cut through his losses in this area and said between college students and out-of-staters, his resources might be better spent appealing to rural voters. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if Zinke's ads were more focused towards like the Three Forks and other rural communities yeah. in this district. Um, because I think I see so. a lot of them when I go home. Mm -hmm. sure. um, so I think, you know, I wonder if that's a very targeted um, kind of thing. I see Chanel stuff on campus all the time. Yeah, she's and really been lately, like especially in person, um, yeah. capitalizing yeah. on being able to visit, talk with students, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So you you definitely see the the presence. I didn't yeah. even know she was coming to camp. Yeah, yeah, she did. Oh, yeah. yeah, she did. Oh yeah, yeah, she came with um green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, yeah. and then they yeah. handed out like food and t-shirts. Actually, um, some of the people who are. I know one of those specifically is a previous MSU student who's working on her campaign with her. Was actually here like a number of days in a row, handing out yeah. food and T-shirts, yeah. and so. Yeah. Interesting. That's because Gallatin County was lagging in vote or in getting in um, ballots. Yeah, voter turnout voter is turnout. is uh, low compared to the rest of the district. I saw that it was so. really low compared to what they predicted as well, based on um, our twenty twenty vote. Yeah, especially but, like with our age group, mm -hmm. the like 18 to 35, yeah. it's extremely low in this district. And they're trying to understand that and increase voter turnout from both sides of the aisle. Yeah. So Well, and you always see voter turnout being lower in midterm elections than right. when there's a presidential candidate on the ballot. But I think it was significantly lower than what they were expecting. Yeah, before. I noticed that when I was going through some election data, the difference between midterm and general, like pre-COVID, was upwards of two hundred thousand votes, mm -hmm. um, and it's 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 an insane fluctuation. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's going to change this election, though, because I know that that general trend, you know, general election always has more voters than midterm. But looking at the other states that have been looking at, you know, early voting, 
and on the eastern states that have just closed their polling, they're looking at record participation in this midterm. So I wonder if the same is going to extend all the way to Montana and Gallatin County. Sure, and I think one big difference that you know makes I, I think one big thing for the national level um, that needs to be recognized is the Dobbs versus Jackson and the effect that it might actually have on voter turnout mm -hmm. because a lot of people are very passionate. Yeah. And so I think that it, it will have a positive effect on the amount of voter turnout for sure. Yeah, I, I think especially where I, I agree with that and that also in rural states, I think that's where people thought they were going to be su surprised about it. Um, but it's really the, the state where it's being contested that it's going to bring out the most voters. And what wasn't it Kansas that Kentucky. Uh, was it Kentucky? Kentucky. 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 Yeah. And, and, and so that, you know, set like a really big like example for rural mm -hmm. states that this is going to increase voter and, and action by mm -hmm. by voters regarding the yeah. issues. So I think another unique thing about it is young people, especially our generation, look at midterms and it's always about the economy. Mm -hmm. And this is finally a chance to debate and look at something that actually impacts younger people's lives. Mm -hmm. And so that yeah. might be another reason that's you know, drawing them in. Sure. And you said earlier about the uh, funds. One interesting thing um, that's happening on the Western race is that there's a lot of out-of-state funds coming into this, into mm. the races. There's a lot of out-of-state money. And yeah. um, because it's one of the many new representative seats in the House, and it could possibly give the Republicans the House and the Senate this sure. year. And there's they're projecting that the Montana legislature is going to have a Republican supermajority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. two seats away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and that's gonna be. I think oh, when I was listening to YPR, I think they said that was like the first time, like, ever. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Which it makes sense. Um, I mean, historically, that the Republicans are gonna take back the U.S. House. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the pendulum swing, yes. essentially. Yes. So. Yeah. President. Um, but the Senate would be interesting. That would be. That would be interesting to see what legislation would be going through and what yeah. would be being done if both were to. Yeah. Election, yeah. So. And Democrats may not have good, a good chance right now because Joe Biden has such low approval ratings. And mm -hmm. historically, when the Democrat has low approval raising, ratings, they have lower voter votes for the Democratic candidates. Yeah, the, yeah. the unique thing, I was, I forget which um, polling website it was, but people, as far as voting Democrat, have actually, um, based on their data, um, really disconnected their approval rating for Joe Biden yeah. with their votes. And a lot of people have said that um, they favor Republican control of Congress, you know, historically speaking, but then at the same time have said in that same poll that they intend to vote Democrat in their yeah. district. So mm -hmm. it kind of like conflicting. It really is. Conflicting mm -hmm. answers. Yeah. 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 Which cool. I think points to a kind of a lot of swing away. We've talked a lot about like, party line voting, and that's been a huge discussion in politics for the past, I, as long as I can remember, was people, the problem with people just voting down a ballot and, you know, voting party line. Um, and so I think more and more that is becoming a commonplace, like, kitchen table discussion of, like, you know, are we going to, like, separate this from this and not have just an entire party line ballot? Yeah. yeah, but I think part of that comes like access to more like resources and candidate resources is that um, voters might distinguish themselves or not distinguish themselves, but distinguish between the national and their local races yeah. and vote more, you know, favorably to an even party ballot. But, but even you know, so, like we were talking earlier, it can be so tough to find information on like really small local yeah. candidates. Yeah. Our state races a little easier, but local candidates and even justices are just really tough to find information on. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And I think one reason why you might see people voting differently in local elections versus state or federal elections is the fact that they might know the person that they're voting for. Right. And especially that makes such a huge difference, especially in Montana, where a lot of our towns are, like our metropolitan areas are very, very small metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty easy to get to know your neighbor. So it's interesting. But sure. the one thing I do like about Montana is that we don't have to register with a party to vote. Yes. So, I was going to bring that up earlier. Yeah. Actually, we were discussing before we yeah. started um, started yeah. broadcasting. But And historically, like Montana, I've always said that it's purple 
because a lot of the times you'll have like a Democratic governor and you might have a Republican Senate. Like it's hard to predict where Montana voters are going to vote, but it, over the last couple of elections, it's progressively gotten more Republican. So it's reflecting a lot of that polarization that we're seeing nationally. But, you know, prior to the last couple of elections, we were pretty, um, pretty purple, not quite as polarized as the rest of the country, but that polarization is catching up to us. Yeah. Yeah, I think another thing, like especially with the Western District and that purple sense is that out-of-state money that's coming in yeah. and out-of-state ad campaigns that are coming in too. Yeah. Um, that was really big in uh, the 2012 Senate election too, the amount of out-of-state ads that were coming in because it was such a contested seat in the sense that this is a very contested seat. Um, and it's it's very interesting to see how much, you know, outside influence out, like that comes from outside the state of Montana um, will have on election results. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we need to talk about the the other candidate too. Oh yeah, the the libertarian yeah. candidate, um, <laughs> John Lamb. Yes. Yeah. Name? Yep, okay. that is his name. Almost didn't know. Uh, so yeah, I think his polling was at one percent or two hmm. percent last time I looked. Um, and it's interesting, um, I did a little bit on the candidate, but not too much, just because the other two were so close. I want to make sure I got a line of going with Vicky. Um, but very pro-Second Amendment, very anti-abortion. Um, another part of it is like pro the Bundy group who occupied federal lands in Oregon and uh, um, Nevada, um, and very much um, don't tread on me kind of candidate. So yeah. it's interesting. It's interesting to see, I think the biggest effect that he could have on the election is taking hardcore Republican votes away from Zinke, which could cost Zinke the race, which is, I think, I think that's an interesting piece. Yeah, it's so. going to work out in Trinnell's favor, because mm -hmm. I doubt anyone who would vote for Trinnell would vote for John Lamb. Right. That's or a libertarian candidate in general. That's interesting, because a lot of her, um, and a lot of the debates going up to this, um, where all three of them have been present. Every time Trinell has had a turn to speak, she's, you know, brought up John Lamb and saying, well, you know, I'm here and John Lamb's here. This is what we're standing for. And then she'll she'll single Zinke out and attack him. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's interesting because you look at their politics and they're on almost opposite ends of the spectrum. Well, I think going back to the fact that if Lamb is able to steal those from Zinke, yeah. that might be the root of that. Yeah. yeah. Where it's like, if we can, you know, stand together on one or two issues that yeah. might be, you know, like I, I'm going to single out thinking on as many issues as I can um, yeah. to keep distancing herself yeah. from him. Um, I think that'll be interesting. Where it's it, it's it's not quite sympathization with Lamb, but it's close to where people might want to vote for Lamb, and then mm -hmm. that ends up helping turn out. So I, that might be where that's going. Yeah. Oh, and traditionally, libertarian candidates poll they get about seven percent of the vote in Montana. That's about where we're at. I know when I ran for office, I ran against a Republican and I ran as a Libertarian and I got 29% of the vote, which was like unheard of in the Libertarian party. I was like, and then uh, my husband ran in a district in Bozeman and he got like 27%. Most people go anywhere from seven to 17% when you see the actual results. So it's really interesting to see that he's only polling at 1% if that he's going to be that polling That might not be that. right, too. So mm. That might not be right. Ah, you might not have accurate information. Yes. So, oh, I, can't, I can't find any polling data. <laughs> to be That's okay. He's a libertarian candidate. <laughs> we kind of know what's going to happen. <laughs> So, yeah, but I, I always kind of thought that it was interesting because, I mean, that's something that you hear a lot. And what you were discussing with the way that debates happen between the three of them is, is similar to how the discussions happened in the Eastern District as well. Um, and that you saw Rottings talking more positively or like siding with Buchanan on things. And although they do have some shared beliefs, there's a lot of different things um, in efforts to be kind of against um, incumbent Rosendale when they were in the debate, but I've always wondered, so we talk about, we know how it's going to be when a libertarian runs, you know, and it's, it's kind of the joke, you know, the butt of the joke and like, don't throw away your votes are a big thing. And, um, 
like even the last presidential like election, they're like don't write your votes by like you know writing people in or doing things like that because um, like every vote matters. And um, I feel like in a lot of contemporary dialogue with other people, you meet a lot of libertarian people in Montana. And that if, if, if the majority of libertarian individuals thought different in Montana, if that would change the proportion of libertarian voters in these races, it's not that like maybe there isn't the presence, but it's just that everyone always assumes that they're never going to do well or if I, it. Yeah. yeah, I would be curious to see how many of like Montana libertarians are going to be voting for Buchanan in the East yeah. In yeah. election who are going to step away from Rosendale either because of national policies or what say you and say, no, I'm going to vote for an independent candidate. Yeah. I've been actually really surprised to see um, how much like public support I've seen Buchanan garner in, in the past couple of months and seeing people's like signs up and that sort of thing. I, I've been pretty shocked. It'll be well, interesting. Yeah. To see. I think a lot of that stems from Rosendale being fairly ideological extreme mm -hmm. and I yeah. think a lot of people are seeking something else and yeah. Buchanan is providing that he is feeling that kind of niche need in the eastern half of the state yeah he's like he's like the medium between mm -hmm. you know because I, I think a lot of people that jump from voting for somebody like previously like Rosendale mm -hmm. and then jumping to voting for Ronning would be is, that's a big jump, that's right? Nice. And so, um, yes. and so it would be a, a, a much safer vote to yes. to go for Buchanan if you still hold conservative ideologies, yeah. but feel that um, with national influence and party lines extending certain directions, that maybe Rosendale is not where people rest anymore. That they would rather go for Buchanan than you know. Yeah, because we were talking about that in class a little bit. Rosendale sits, I think, at 0. 0.6 on the ideological scale. When mm -hmm. you're talking about the ideological scale, you have zero, and then the Democrats are like negative, or you know, traditional liberals are in the negatives, and then your conservatives are in the positive. Mm -hmm. And Rosendale was somewhere in the 0. 0.6 range. Yeah. Um, do based on the 116th, or I mean, 117th Congress. Sorry, 116th. Based on his stuff in the 117th Congress. Um, I know there's a lot of factors that go into that score, but um, another thing we were looking at was like the fact of limited co-sponsorship from Rosendale, mm -hmm. um, like while in the 117th Congress, reaching across the aisle and getting Democratic co-sponsors on his bills was minimal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's also an interesting effect. Um, and yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, it's interesting how that go, but we can talk a little bit more about the Eastern District later too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think we could probably step away for about a 10 minute break, eat, eat some of our lovely snacks, and then we can come back. Yeah, Works for me. So, all right. All right. Wonderful. Well, we will be back to you in 10 minutes. Well, okay. anyways, We're here back. we are. We're back. We're back. Awesome. We got some streamers coming in from Washington. Big shout out to my family for <laughs> <laughs> supporting our live stream. I'm pretty sure they're all of our viewers right now. Yeah. I'm, awesome. I'm still waiting for my husband to log in. He's on. I Perfect. Think. It's the I'm here. Was it the chat? Wonderful. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Well, hello, honey. Um, anyway, my so parents decided not to sign on. They're taking care of a puppy. Oh no, so that's a valid. That's a valid reason. <laughs> Are we gonna jump into our Eastern District? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Do. Definitely. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about our candidates. Yeah. Well. Um, there's, I mean, three major candidates, that is. We've got uh, Gary Buchanan as our independent, Penny Ronning as the Democrat, and incumbent Matt Rosendale um, as the Republican candidate. Um, I did some research on Ronning, so I can talk about her and, and kind of get uh, the floor, you know, ground laid for her. Um, I think currently she lives in Livingston, um, but she was previously a uh, councilwoman for Billings in Ward 4, actually. Uh, she graduated from MSU. Actually, she has an interesting educational background with a degree in film, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. And then she went to um, U Mary, which if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, is in North Dakota. And she got her MBA from there. Um, so her focus is on her campaign page and the things that I found that she discussed is very, very broad. She covers a lot of issues. Um, but obviously, as with her lining with democratic values, for the most part on the national level, level she does discuss um, protection of women against violence. She covers the recent things on Roe v. Wade, um, you know, the Dobbs v. Jackson case that was recently um, a big debate. 
So that's something that she covers. Um, she also talks about First Nations people, which is not something that's specifically individual to uh, Democratic candidates, but it's something that you don't always see as a as a key or central issue for people who are running as representatives in Montana. Um, so let's see. There's a big thing for her. She talks. I mean, there's a lot of things. Um, she she tends to line pretty central Second Amendment. She's pro gun rights. Uh, she also similar to Monica Trinnell believes in common sense gun laws, um, as well as mental health funding because she uh, sees that as a big contributor to not only uh, mass shootings but also the mental health crisis that is going on in Montana, especially within rural communities. That. Um, a lot of rural deaths by suicide are most likely to happen with guns. And so she talks about that and covers that in the debate as well. Um, big on health care, increasing of accessibility and affordability um, with another central focus on rural communities and like telehealth and access to health care within rural communities. Um, let's see. I think, yeah, so pretty central on a lot of those values. Um, let's see. Agriculture. That's a big one that she covers is um, having resourcing jobs back into the United States, but also protecting, for example, like cattle meat production within what is like having she wants to reinstate labels that tell the country of origin, um, which is something that was previously repealed. And she wants to have that back in so that you can see where your meat comes from um, in order to try to re-centralize uh, meat production and, and the social value of meat production coming from Montana, which is really interesting, as well as um, is big on, you know, talks about climate change and environmental issues. But one of the big things is she seems to support most like of our energy sources that we have, like non-renewable right now, but also wants to expand co like at the same time because she doesn't think it's going to be a quick process expand into more renewable energy sources and one of her big things on that is centered around that thing she talks about jobs a lot is bringing more jobs in and she believes that in upping our renewable resource energy that it'll bring more jobs to montana which was an interesting point that she made in the debate so and aside from that i mean wants to put inflation caps on on companies for energy, you know, costs and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's about it. It's kind of, it's similar to what Wyatt was talking about with Monica Chanel. When running as a Democrat in Montana, you're going to be more moderate. And a lot of her issues do center around Montana values. She talks about rural communities a lot, rural health care, rural mental health, agriculture, ranching. So, um, Yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting contrast to Rosendale, um, who's also running. And so as an incumbent, um, he's got a lot of legislative experience. Um, so that'll be kind of an interesting to see how that stacks up um, in the polls as they come in. Mm -hmm. um, but he is a pretty ideologically extreme um, member of Congress at the moment. Um, like we talked about earlier, um, not a lot of like, um, across the aisle work from Matt Rosendale. Um, so that's, I mean, he stands pretty much with the Republican Party on most issues on a national level. Um, and that's a lot of what he talks about is national issues. Mm -hmm. um, so in, you know, contrast to uh, Monica Chanel and um, uh, Are you talking about Zink or? No, Oh, Ron, 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 yes, yes, there he is. Um, you know, doesn't talk as much about like maybe Montana specific issues, but addresses mm -hmm. more of the, the kind of um, hot national issues. Yeah. Um, so gives that a lot of a lot of attention and a lot of care. So yeah, and I, I think I mean, Stram made a comment on that. We were. Live streaming, we, we didn't, and some of us didn't know it. Um, I had no idea. <laughs> I did not either. Um, but uh, uh, but we talked about uh, that's because Rosendale in the Eastern District is uh, it's going to be more conservative, or right? I mean, within Montana, that's assumable, but also within the Eastern District is um, tends to be very conservative. And so he's not in an expansionist phase right now. He doesn't have to try to. Mm -hmm. Um, get more people as part of his constituency and expand the issues that he's talking about. He can really centralize in the things that he cares about, or like you said, committee involvement, yep. that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that you really do see that reflected in just how 
how he is as a politician, what he says, what he does, mm -hmm. legislation he works on. So. I think going back to that too, it's like if you know if he wins more than fifty five percent of the vote, he's likely going to spend more time in Washington and work with his colleagues in the Republican Party more mm -hmm. to promote national legislation than he is. Yeah, he, he's not going to focus as much to bringing pork and other mm -hmm. um, things back to his constituency. Yeah, that, so because of his comfortable constituency base. Yeah. I think that might be actually a good segue into talking about Gary Buchanan, too, because yeah. he is the independent running against Rosendale. And the reason why he entered the race was because of Rosendale's no vote on Ukraine aid. That's why he entered. Um, and, like, he is... It's interesting to me because he seems he seems to be fairly conservative. He's definitely more fiscally conservative than Rosendale. But at the same time, he also is, like... He's not anti abort well he's not necessarily pro-choice for himself but he's not pro like taking abortion away like he's very focused on privacy and medical privacy and that encompasses the issues of abortion um so that's really interesting too but yeah he is your kind of like you're just standard eastern montana guy he's a business owner and um he's from i think he's from Billings, actually. Um, but yeah, he's really concerned about federal spending, mm -hmm. money, the economy, things that impact rural, rural Montanans a lot. And he also is very pro Second Amendment. Um, and he doesn't support the transfer of federal lands to state ownership or private hands. Yes, that's what yeah. that actually is like a big central discussion um, with the Eastern District right now. And I forget what that um, it's, what that act is called. I have it pulled up somewhere. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see on the Pittman Robertson Act. Yeah. Um, and so that's been a big source of debate. It, it's a central argument for Ronnie on why she should receive votes that um, that Rosendale should not is because of the whole big, you know, land transferring and so yeah. that, that's a really big contentious issue right now between those those candidates yeah and he also um as far as like energy independence and domestic and global security he uh he's very big on you know the united states being independent with their energy he doesn't like support importing of energy or anything like that. And he wants to put a path towards energy independence with an emphasis on alternative energy, which is really interesting. Um, and as far as like domestic and global security, he also is really um, concerned about protecting democracy from what he calls our internal threats um, to the health and welfare of Americans and interests abroad. So. He's kind of like one of those like right down the middle kind of guys, mm -hmm. a very moderate kind of guy. Um, and it's interesting, too, because he is running as an independent. And there is also a libertarian candidate, Sam Rankin, mm -hmm. who is from Billings. And he's a real estate broker and an attorney. And I think he's self-funding his campaign. Um, I think so. Yeah. And I don't think he's made it into any polls or debates um, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but oh, I have not pulled up here. Give me a second. Yeah, um, going back to the can, just to touch um, while you're yeah. looking at that, um, I think an interesting comparison is like, I, I don't know, based on his campaign page and other stuff, it reminds me a lot of like Suzanne Collins kind of politician, where it's like maybe leans one way on some issues, you know, maybe Republican here and there, but very much just pretty yeah. center, willing to go across the aisle on necessary means. Um, so if he does win, that would be a very interesting. It will. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that I found interesting about him when you're talking about things that he does flip flop on is, um, during the debate that they had, I think the singular debate that they had for, yes. for the Eastern district, they asked actually about Ukraine security. And so a lot of his big things are like one of the big things is, yeah, he is really fiscally conservative and just believes that. But on both sides of the partisan divide, there's just too much spending, spending at the federal level. Um, and at the state level as well. But um, um, and then beyond that, he's also really big on national security. But his thing on Ukraine, what you said was his his basically his running line. Um, he was when they asked questions on 
what what is the extent of the United States' involvement in that, especially considering how much money we've already put into it. That was where he was willing to actually change and cross over a little bit from his fiscally conservative beliefs because um, he believes, I think if I remember correctly in the debate when he was talking about it, is that, for example, if uh, Russia were to um, overcome Ukraine and it was, and you know, Ukraine was to succumb to Russian powers that he would, be, he believes that that's a threat of democracy and that it would almost kind of like, it's like a slippery slope kind of thing. And so that we should invest as much money in as necessary to a help Ukraine, um, overcome Russia, but then also actually he said, even in allies within greater Europe as well. Um, so that was something that I found really interesting on that discussion. So mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. So he takes national security and democracy, like you said, mm -hmm. very seriously, apparently. He does, very seriously. That's That was his whole reason for running. Mm -hmm. really? um, but yeah, so back to Sam Rankin. He, like I said, he's a billings attorney and real estate broker. He also was in the Peace Corps and is a U.S. Army veteran. He... Um, he is kind of like your typical um, libertarian. He basically on his campaign page, he says women own their bodies and consenting adults should be free to choose their own sexual practices and personal relationships. And those seem to be like his really big issues. But he's also, and I'm, I couldn't figure out if he's actually related to Jeanette Rankin, but he actually has been on her campaign or on his campaign page he has this really big thing about continuing the Rankin tradition. So I, I think, I can't say for sure that he is a descendant of her, but I think he might be. Um, and he also is like super concerned too about um, where campaigns get their cash and dark money and lobbyists and PACs. So like kind of like the typical like standard libertarian issues. And I don't think he's going to get any votes because libertarians traditionally don't get very many in Montana, although they do poll a little bit higher than other states. But it is interesting that we have that little wild card in there. But I think Buchanan's more of a wild card than Rankin. Yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see the amount of votes that, that he polls, so. For sure. And kind of talk about like where he pulls them from because he is so moderate, mm -hmm. you know, and so what, the people who vote for him, would they have gone, you know, right or left, you know, kind of see where he pulls those from, I think will be very interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a pretty, like, I think one of the biggest contrasts between Rosendale and Buchanan so far um, that we've discussed is probably the gun issue mm -hmm. um, a little bit, you mm -hmm. know, like reading his campaign page. It's like, yeah. yes, I believe in the Second Amendment, I believe it's like the cultural aspect of Montanans, but at the same time, like, it's necessary for our it was like children and grandchildren on the campaign page mm -hmm. that we yeah. do something about mass shootings and other gun violence related issues so they have a safe America. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that's, a, that's an interesting contrast between the two candidates. Yeah, which I think actually on when what's it's it's interesting because then there's moderate and then like what's considerate to like maybe the, considered moderate to the Eastern District. And I would believe that that might be one um, of his more contentious issues for voters who are debating on switching between like maybe voters who previously voted for Rosendale and were considering Buchanan. Cause we did, we discussed that with them that, uh, it seems that Rosendale has moved farther to the right, um, within, you know, the last few years. And so that people might be pulled to Buchanan because of how moderate he is. And I feel that, um, maybe any sort of discussion about gun control is something in Montana that people are kind of weary of. Um, and so I wonder if what effect that has on people would be interesting. Yeah, I think part of that shift from Rosendale that you're speaking to is because he was in a relatively close election in 2020, all things considered, and went against a, a solid candidate. Um, I can't remember her name, but um, at the time, and he only won by, I want to say, 8%. Mm -hmm. What's the most? So, um, wasn't was he running? Was it a Democrat? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was, um, what's her bucket? It was a gal, wasn't it? Yeah, with the gray hair, gray hair. With the, oh, I remember uh, her. And she like had the ad with the shotgun and she was like, mm -hmm. that's for yeah. gun rights. Oh, man. Why like, can I not remember the, her name? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I actually wrote, I lived hard in That's what it was. I, mean. I would like <laughs> Strand to reenact all of the campaign ads from every election. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try for Bobcat's Got Talent. 
and what yeah, that's all about. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see. I'll pull up on ballot pieces. Wait, is that actually it. a thing? Yes. Mm-hmm. Really? That's a thing. Yeah, the residence halls are there. Oh. Yeah. I didn't know that was a thing. It's coming in December. And what is it? Bobcat's Got Talent. It's just like a talent show? It's pretty much. Sponsored ad. This is a sponsored ad to go to Bobcat's Got Talent. Oh! Uh, Captain Williams. Is there it is. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I knew that. No, I like, I just couldn't come up with no, that. No, But no, her campaign ads were everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, uh, she again, targeted Bozeman really, really hard because I think she saw this as a demographic of voters that she could really, like, capitalize on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah. Um, now with the split, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. And it'll be interesting to see in the foreseeable future, because as we talked about, I mean, I'm not sure, I mean, like with predictions, it's mm-hmm. it's probably unlikely that a Democratic candidate would win in the Eastern District. And so it'll be interesting to see that now that we have two districts, how that plays out and mm-hmm. what consistency we see in the partisan um, ship of both the districts over yeah. time. Yeah. So and I think yeah. another aspect to that, going back to earlier, is like weather. And the, how that, how the snowstorm, mm-hmm. like how this recent weather is going to affect mm-hmm. the Eastern District, because mm-hmm. people have to drive farther to go to the polling stations to vote than they do in the Western District, mm-hmm. or to get their absentee ballot into a county station. County stations are less than in the Western District because you have bigger counties covering more area. Mm-hmm. So I think that'll also be an interesting aspect of turnout in this midterm for the Eastern District. Yeah, and when you bring up absentee voting in the Eastern District, it's really interesting to me because there's on um, there's been pushing pushes from the state legislature about controlling absentee voting and you know re reforming it. Um, which is really interesting because people who live in the eastern side of the state tend to be a little bit more Republicans, and Republicans tend to not be in favor of absentee voting because of voter fraud and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, um, um, I think so, a really interesting part of yeah. that, though, um, we were talking about this in class. But yeah, I, I, was, I was just thinking of that. Yeah. voting actually helped the Republicans. Yes, it did. Yeah, the yeah. Republicans were actually able to vote, especially in the eastern district. Mm, yeah. So if they... Um, if it does become a supermajority in the state Congress, how is that going to affect absentee voting in the future, right. especially for rural eastern yeah. communities yeah. who tend to like flow more Republican with their voter turnout? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, no, exactly. It's it, that's one of the really interesting things is as an issue, you see that um, Republicans generally are against are against it for voter fraud issues, but that it helps them. So yeah, no, that'll be really yeah. interesting to see how that plays out in the future and and if. Like, I wonder how many, like, Republicans, if, say, hypo- hypothetical situation, like, absentee ballot, ballot voting was totally gotten rid of, like, mm-hmm. how many Republicans would suddenly be in favor of absentee voting? I don't know. I think yeah. Republicans are in favor of absentee voting as it is. I think it's mail-in voting that's the difference to where yeah, it's, um, you know, absentee voting in Montana, you have to request a ballot. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it comes to you, and then you have to mail it back. With posts, as you return it into your local courthouse or what or polling station. Um, whereas mail in voting, say in Washington, you don't have to request and the ballot comes in the mail. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a difference in for Republicans that um, signifies like what they desire in their voting habits mm-hmm. to where they, they actually like absentee voting, um, especially if they're like vacationing in the wintertime mm-hmm. and want that absentee ballot because they're at their second home and they're retired in Arizona or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think that's an interesting differentiation that is important. Well, and also yeah. one of the things that we discussed about that is that um, mail-in voting and absentee voting is not the same in every single state. And so sometimes those yeah. terms are interchangeable and sometimes they're not. Yeah. And so um, when you see discussed on a national level, people's opinions on that, it, it, it's pretty funny because you're like, it, it, the conversation is so diverse that yeah. on what that means between state to state. Well, exactly. nobody seems to be quite on the same page. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. So I, I didn't know it was a different thing until we talked about it, what, like a month ago? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think a, an interesting distinguishment as well, though, is that um, parts of Montana do, in, do do mail in voting mm-hmm. for like local, local special elections. topic elections yeah. um, mm-hmm. co- as compared to like these general yeah. elections. So I think that's an interesting one too. Yeah. 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 So, are we yeah. expecting our friends from Montpur? To... I thought we were, but we haven't um, covered Rosendale yet. Yeah, we Solely. Yeah, we I mean, we, we talked about him talk in comparison. But... And we talked about his representational style. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
I think I'm we'll here. Finish. I'm paying attention. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about it before. We talked. Uh, we talked about the candidate. Then we went to Rosendale. Oh, yeah, okay. about the Libertarian candidate. So it was a brief discussion on Rosendale, but. Um, <laughs> But I think it's I think it hit on the main point. I think it's uh, very nationalized yeah, yeah. Republican. And that's yeah. He's big, he's big on border security yeah. and not yeah. not necessarily like northern border. That's something that came up in the debate a lot, actually, was talking about southern border security when talking about Montana issues. Um yeah, that, that's something that he brought up actually a number of times in the, the district debate was yeah. that we need to secure the southern border. So that's a big thing for him. Well, and that is also very interesting because Montana as an ag-based state, um, oftentimes in the summer, we are really dependent on migrant workers. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you start talking about southern border security, that gets looped into that discussion very quickly. And that was not something that Rosendale really touches on a lot at all. Yeah. Um, but our ag economy is very, very dependent upon those people mm -hmm. uh, being able to be in the state and work for our farms and ranches and orchards and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a really interesting, interesting thing there. So. Yeah, I think previous stats, there's usually around three to four million individual um, migrant, you know, seasonal farm workers mm -hmm. in the United States who who move around to meet the needs of farms during uh, like harvesting season mm -hmm. and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with Moscow, but um, after that, our, our agenda is pretty clear to where I think we can wrap this up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and call it an evening for yeah. folks. So, and do yeah. we want to talk about um, the local races? Um, I mean, we can, I, I, I don't know, if, you know, for certainly, I mean, I'm, part of it is like, I didn't have a ton of information to bring to the table yeah. about them because yeah. I couldn't find a lot of information. Yeah. I'm also so, local depending on. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know a lot of about the local races here because I voted in my home county. Yeah, yeah right. I voted in my home county. Yeah, so I think we're actually yeah, all voting for different, different local. Counties, yeah, so. yeah. yeah. voting for yeah. different local, yeah. Yeah. local yeah. things. Um, yeah. I, I live in the MSU district. So I voted yeah. in, in um, it was Pat Flowers and Randy Chamberlain right. and then Alice Buckley. And um, I forget who the name is that's running against her, but she's actually a student. She's a grad student here. Right. And see, I voted in the Belgrade district, which was the Hinkles um, yeah. and some other folks. And um, uh, yeah, I think the only thing that we could connect on is county, and I can't remember. Help, to be quite honest, so well, mm -hmm. uh, there is County that. attorney Audrey Cromwell was right as Marty Lambert. Oh, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah that's true. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah. That's and yeah. he's not very popular right now. Interesting. Uh, at least from what I've heard. I haven't actually looked at any data. I've just I don't heard. know if there is any data. That's yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we discussed that voter information in yeah. our counties and local races is so par at best. Right. Um, I think especially in Montana because it is just so small. Mm -hmm. I think once you get towards like California, New York, some of those the like, coverage is more popular oh, yeah. states, yeah. <laughs> there's just way more coverage on some of those local things. Well, one of the reasons why there isn't a lot of coverage either right now is because there's not a lot of money. Yeah. Like That's small, yeah, small yeah. populations for sure. yeah. 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 yeah, I haven't done a ton of research about the local, but I am absolutely obsessed with Pat Flowers' names. I think it's so cute. I, I think it's so it. cute. It's Honest hot <laughs> flowers? Are you kidding? Me? Are you kidding me? That's We're so talking cute. about things that sway voters, like talking yeah. about like <laughs> that's yeah. it. That's it. I'm so mad. Yeah, like, that's I don't even know anything else. You know, it's, that's <laughs> actually an interesting thing to think about. Like what? Like if you didn't know anything about a candidate, like you know, there was mm -hmm. on the ballot, there was um, like you vote for three. And um, it had them listed yeah. off, and there was like yeah. three women and two men. Yeah, on the county. And yeah. like, if you know nothing about them, or if you're a woman, are you going to vote for the women? Yeah. Or you're more inclined to at least. Yeah, more inclined sure. to. Or like, if they have like a weird sounding name, are you going to not vote for them? You know, sure. that's that it's those kind of things, things, like psychological things that happen when you vote too. Yeah. Um, I think that got brought up a bit when Dr. Al was running the Republican. It was because nobody, nobody can pronounce, pronounce the last. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it is interesting. And um, one of the things about the ballot, the ballot for Yellowstone County is a majority of the races, people were actually running, like it was a Republican candidate running 
without an opponent. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder how that affects people's voting on there. It was like a lot, it was like a significant amount of them, of the races. And so I wonder how that affected people's voting on whether they're like, well, this is the only name I see, so I'm going to vote for them. Um, Not having like a writing off the top of their head or not, you know, that sort of thing. Um, Speaking of which, did did either of you get to vote in Mallory's district? I actually do live in Mallory's district. Yeah, no, coincidentally, because it's really funny. I think she's uh, District 50 in um for i think that's what it is right district 50 for the montana house um and so i mean the chances of someone living there aren't very high so that that's very coincidental that i actually well i guess that's my my parents place of residence and if they're still on the live stream right now actually would have also voted in her district so that is crazy mm-hmm. so yeah, she's, she's, she's a student here right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. she's I, one of our classes i've so. never actually met her yeah, oh, yeah. she's yeah. so cool she's awesome and she's from um she's yeah she's actually obviously the, she's from billings but yeah. yeah yeah she's the youngest state representative yeah ever um yeah because let's see she was i think she was 18 she was because 18. she was 18 or, yeah, 18 or 19 when she was 18 or 19 oh, yeah. she might have been 18 elected 19 when she actually went in office yeah yes because i think she just Mm-hmm. Shout out to Mallory. <laughs> yeah, shout out to that, our representative cool. or my representative, yeah. Mallory. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and she, she did not run unopposed. There was somebody uh, in that oh. district. Oh, actually. Yeah. She in the first election? No, in this election that just happened. Oh, right now, okay. um, yeah. on the ballot, it was one of the, the one of the few things on the ballot where someone was actually running um, oh. and an incumbent was running opposed. So there was only like two unopposed races on there. Oh yeah. So. The only unopposed the only unopposed race that I had was for the sheriff. Yes, the sheriff race. Yeah. yeah there's completely unopposed. Sorry, unopposed. I, I don't I wonder what would incentivize somebody to run for that. I, I I think it's like kind of like a certain type of person that would do it. Yeah, I have no clue. Yeah. But, um yeah, do we want to go into a little bit of like what our club is and well, we can talk about that. What we do. Um Okay, cool. Mr. President? Well, yeah, yeah, you're so, the president, yeah we're the Political Science Society. I'm the president, Strang Knudsen. Um, it's a great time, I think. Um, this is our first event, and we're very stoked to put it on. Um, and we're very, I think, excited to see these uh, midterm results and what they'll bring for the state and what they'll bring for like our local districts, too, and how they're going to affect us as MSU students. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why we're here, is because we're, we're motivated to... Um, have an impact on our district and our MSU community, yeah. more or less, and Definitely. make sure they're informed and um, and are understanding local issues so that affect the campus. So and, you know, we're talking about how there is no information on local races mm-hmm. and complaining about it. Maybe we should do something about it. That's that's what I'm thinking. I know I was thinking about that too as well, actually. Yeah. You know, I I had mentioned this at our because. A lot of us are also on ASMSU. Um, yeah, I'm wearing my, I didn't know if we were wearing our set of name tags. Yeah. So I put mine on. I'm not. Maybe we need, <laughs> maybe we need a political size. We should make <laughs> some for ourselves. A little Montana one. Like mm-hmm. uh, but I think one thing that we could do as a club is start trying to get groups of students to go down with them to the um, committee, account, the yeah. city commission. The city commission. Okay. Meetings because awesome. you know how Lucas was talking about like the university is kind of stepping out of the housing issue. Yeah. We need to show as students that we are impacted by the city of Bozeman's so decisions decision. about housing. Sure. And, and like testimonial. Testimonial things. stuff. And if we just show up and we're there, mm-hmm. I think if we get enough people and we're gonna make a make a, a splash. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. That's something for the future. Yeah, just a Um, thought. Yeah, Yeah. so, but we're very excited. Um, I know we're going to have some more events in the spring, but we all have finals coming up and Thanksgiving break and such, so. And we will have social media at some point. Yeah, we're going to get social media. We're going to get social media. I actually know if we had social media or not. We don't. We're working on it. We're working on it. We've got this YouTube page. Yeah. I I talked to Kelsey about it. Well, I talked to you and Kelsey, and you said to hold off until the spring. Yeah, we're we're going to talk in December about that. Okay. But yeah, but uh, we have club meetings once a month uh, in the political science commons. Um, so that's pretty exciting. It's basically the first Friday of each month, really. Yeah. And so if you're a student, at 1 p.m. come yeah. join us. Yeah. Friday is 1 p.m. Uh, yeah, Friday is 1 p.m. So yeah, um, but 
I think there's been a lively discussion. So. It's lively and a lovely yeah. discussion. <laughs> so, lively and lovely. Yeah, I think we'll, yeah. we'll sign awesome. off. So yes. thank you for our well, thank you for adjourn for the night. night. Yeah. And I'm going to go home and take care of my sick kid. Okay. So, yeah. All right. I'm straight. <laughs> Thank <laughs> <laughs> you.